to me. Hi, folks. Um, before I do anything, I see there's there's a question coming into the coming into the host chat um, asking why community college libraries weren't listed on the survey. Uh, I don't know. Um, that was an oversight. Um, so I apologize to those um, from community colleges that are attending. Uh, personally, I've worked at three or four throughout my career, uh, and we have them represented in the books as well. So I don't know what happened there, but trust me, it was not an intentional oversight. Um, so my apologies for that. Uh, as for my background, um, I've been working with, man, I've been working with LibGuides probably about the same amount of time as Aaron. Uh, I am not the admin on my campus, um, but I do do content creation. Uh, uh, have been using it in some interesting ways to support some projects that I've worked on. Um, I still do do a lot of hand coding and HTML um, for other projects um, where I don't have access to LibGuides. But when I do have access, it's my, what I choose to use. So anyway, back to Aaron. So our goal with these two books were uh, to offer several expect the, to offer perspectives from several experts um, about LibGuides, how to use it, uh, how best to use it if you're brand new, what to think about before you start and that sort of things. Um, many of these things I would like to have known when I was in my various stages of planning, migrating, or implementing LibGuides at my current institution. So we, we tried to make it as useful as possible for both the beginner and the people that have been doing this for quite some time. Uh, here's a little bit about our chapter authors. Our chapter authors, like us, are LibGuides administrators or content creators. Uh, mainly everyone is from academic libraries. Uh, academics include uh, our ones all the way down to or all the way up to uh, community colleges, public and private, large and small, um, from so from Ohio State University down to uh, Wake Technical Community College. Uh, everybody contributed a whole bunch of stuff, and uh, and let me just talk a little bit about the applications. I'm assuming everyone on the call knows a little bit about the SpringShare applications, right? LibGuides, LibApps. Um, hopefully I won't horrify anyone at SpringShare who happens to be on this call. Uh, say hi in the comments, would you? So to me, the base uh, of a useful to users and easy to manage library website is LibGuides, as I said earlier. Uh, it looks like most of us on the call are on LibGuides 2 with a few smatterings of LibGuides 1 still. I, uh, I remember LibGuides 1 and I encourage you, if you can, to migrate up. LibGuides to me is the secret ingredient. Anyone watch Kung Fu Panda? What's the secret about secret ingredient soup? There's no secret. So when developing your LibGuide content, uh, there's a lot of flexibility in LibGuides, but remember, with great flexibility comes great responsibility. Uh, so we've integrated at my institution LibGuides with LibAnswers, with LibChat. Uh, we've integrated LibCal. We're starting up on LibAnalytics, which is a lot of fun. LibStaffer, if you haven't heard of it yet, uh, automatically creates your desk rotation schedule for you. Uh, so if you're tired of creating a, a schedule, that was that's a nice little feature. And then we have uh, LibWizard, which is forms and surveys, uh, and then also an easy to create tutorials and assessments. LibWizard came out too late for us to include in this book, which is a big regret of mine, but uh, something for you to asynchronize your instructional efforts, and uh, it allows you to expand your extend your LibAnswers responses with a, maybe a quick video tutorial right there in the answer. Uh, it's pretty nice. So from here I'll be talking about integrating LibGuides into library websites, right, book one. This is the uh, nuts and bolts overview. Uh, along the way I'm hoping that I will brag on our chapter authors and hopefully remember to call them out by name as uh, their different chapters and topics come up. Ryan and I broke out the contents into four sections. We have introduction and overview to LibGuides and LibApps. We have administering and maintaining LibGuides, designing and developing effective LibGuides, and then uh, pedagogical concerns. So pedagogy and instruction with LibGuides. Our goal with this book is to provide logically oriented set of recommendations and cautionary tales. Um, I'm usually the example that everyone holds up and says, don't do it the way he did it. But uh, that's why we have our 15 experts in this book here. Uh, so 
we aim for conceptual presentations rather than mechanistic click here, then click here, then click there. Um, as you know, command uh, menus do change, so it's better to talk about concepts than to do it uh, exactly click here, click there. So flexibility versus good design. Uh, it's not quite you got your flexibility in my good design, uh, you know, peanut butter and chocolate, but uh, it's pretty it's pretty good. You've heard a lot about the new version of LibGuides, but maybe you're not sure how to leverage the functionality of the new version or whether you should integrate various lib apps into your LibGuide site. So this first section here is just talking about ideas and options for newer users and administrators. Emily King uh, covers developing a local content strategy for your library website before even touching the administrator controls. She also covers initial setup and content workflows. Uh, lib apps, the whole thing is an inter interrelated system that you can incorporate into your holistic site. Stephanie Metko, Lauren Presley, and Jonathan Bradley uh, give us options for integrating libguides, chat, calendar, and surveys into a site with a little bit of localized custom code to provide an integrated user experience across their website. That was at Virginia Tech. But remember, libguides is more about, more about, wow, my notes make no sense, so I'm just going to riff it from here. Uh, LibGuides is about exceeding user expectations. We have Christine Tobias, uh, who's describing my preparing for your migration from old to new. So those of you that are still on uh, version one, hopefully this chapter will be uh, of use to you. As I said a little bit ago, I would love to have had a pre-migration implementation plan, but uh, it didn't occur to me when I tried it, so I just went for it. and. Then I undid it and redid it. It was a lot of fun. Um, so let's talk creativity versus insanity. How many of you out there are as insane as me? How many of you are as creative as me? Remember, these aren't mutually exclusive. You can be creative and insane, uh, one with the other or one without. So you've heard a lot about responsive or mobile-first design. Um, this section covers how LibGuides administrators and designers uh, can understand the underpinnings of LibGuides before breaking and then fixing their LibGuide site. Um, I've broken mine a few times, and support has reset me twice um, for some of my creations. So hopefully in this section here, you'll avoid some of the things that I've broken. So support your content creators and users with a solid understanding of your LibGuides administration. Uh, remember, LibGuides is built on Bootstrap. Hopefully all of you are at least a little bit familiar with Bootstrap. Brigid Gonzalez provides an overview of Bootstrap layout and features. She discusses options for building custom templates at the Bootstrap level. Bootstrap works on a 12-column system, and she breaks down how easy it is to adjust your width of columns based on those 12 columns in the Bootstrap framework. LibGuide's administration is fairly straightforward and will benefit from a thorough understanding of options. Paul Thompson takes a slightly different look in the uh, administrative options and offers ideas for layout and CSS uh, with JavaScript troubleshooting using your browser development tools. If you're not familiar with those, he gives you a quick once over there. And also leveraging uh, LibGuide's asset statistics and APIs for additional functionality. Uh, that's actually a cool chapter, and I've already been implementing things in there since I have access to it already. Um, you also, you probably want to actively administer your content and, ma and uh, monitor your content standards and your user training. Three authors for uh, Chapter 6 here, Jennifer Baisley, Jennifer Natal, and Elizabeth Stewart, uh, Sullivan, uh, talk about organizing and implementing a group of people who go through um, to help train and give feedback to content creators in your LibGuide site. Uh, we've, we've started implementing that here already, too. So uh, at Ada Smith, offers processes supporting an overarching content strategy. Again, going back to my first chapter there, having a content strategy up front will really help you later. Uh, so she helps with designing content guidelines, adopting content maintenance schedules. If you haven't thought of that yet, perhaps, uh, these are some good ideas that will come in. Let's talk about usability and, and uh, accessibility. So everything that's come before now uh, will be improved by taking into account accessibility and usability. Hopefully you've 
you'll uh, take a look at this before you even start implementing if you have not yet implemented. So you've heard a lot about accessibility and usability, uh, and you're looking for theoretical and concrete ideas to implement. This section is next, uh, and that should help. Josh Welker talks about information architecture principles, accommodating various mental models of the beginning researcher and the expert researcher. Uh, so we'll have discussions about side versus tab navigation, um, content usability recommendations, what to do, what not to do, and then maybe um, highlight some ways around some design and layout challenges when you're adjusting screen sizes between a regular computer and a telephone, for example. Uh, Jala Fazilian and um, Melissa Vetter talk about the two default templates, right, tabbed and, and uh, left nav. They talk about the focus group work that they did to uh, develop whether they want to transition libguides from the traditional tab navigation to side. They did end up going that way, and they'll tell you how and why, and uh, explain the process that they used to get there. They didn't want to just change it without users having a voice. So make sure that you talk to your users before you make big changes. Daniel Skaggs will talk about um, designing for intentional, accessible navigation by people with uh, visual mobility and hearing disabilities, screen readers, and uh, just straight keyboard navigation. She also will talk about accessibility tools, which have come in really handy when I'm doing my design. Um, I've been able to leverage some of these already to fix some, some problems I didn't even know about. Um, the neat one is the uh, keyboard navigation. Now that that's fixed, um, I've got compliments from my screen reader users. So this has been great. Melissa Green talks about accessibility design challenges and solutions for each type of content in LibGuides. She also offers methods for testing the usability of, of your content and then re uh, provides recommendations for uh, library administrators to improve set policies to improve uh, accessibility and requirements. The last thing we got to remember is pedagogy. And for those of you that don't know what pedagogy is, it's, you know, it's the theory of teaching. Uh, so teach where, we, where they are. Teach your students, teach your users where you are. We, we in our books are very academic focused, but these also will apply to public library sites, uh, schools. They're, all these ideas are framed in very academic uh, language, but I, I just want to highlight that uh, taking these design considerations into place while you are designing your public library site, for example, is going to improve the experience for your users. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I was talking about pedagogy and lost myself. Um, this last section of our book is uh, tips and best practices for effective pedagogy. So uh, Elizabeth German and Stephanie Graves will talk about uh, incorporating learning outcomes right into your LibGuides, into your lesson plans, and uh, differentiated instructional uh, delivery in, in LibGuides design. Kimberly Shodick will talk about uh, meeting web standards and, and recommends incorporating various web standards into your LibGuides display. Lucinda Rush talks about uh, formative assessment on your LibGuides and um, for assessing how well your users do based on uh, some of the statistics that LibGuides gathers. And then lastly, uh, Melissa Gomez highlights the importance of LibGuides to support a flipped classroom model. So uh, long story short, this first book here is basically to give you a nice overview of how to do the things that you're going to do and things to think about ahead of time before you just start implementing things. Uh, don't make the Aaron Dobbs mistake of just jumping in with two feet. Uh, actually think about it ahead of time. From here, I'm going to roll to Ryan, and he will talk about uh, innovative LibGuides application. Hi, folks. So I've been watching the chat. I see some people asking if this is a promo for the book, a book ad, discussion of LibGuides. Um, in a perfect world, it will be both. Um, so just so there's no confusion, uh, I see we've already lost a couple of people. Um, this is, in some ways, a thinly veiled book ad, um, maybe not so thin. Um, you know, when we were asked to do this by Roman and Littlefield, that was part of the point. Uh, now I see the numbers ticking down further. But I'm going to call a little bit of an audible. Um, 
Uh, if you can give me about two seconds just to talk about what the second book addresses, which is different. Um, we're going to fast forward then into actual discussion, um, since I get the impression that that's a lot of why people are here. And I'd rather give you what you want rather than, uh, rather than see everybody leave. So Aaron's book, I shouldn't say Aaron's book, but the one that he was primary author on, focused a little bit more on the technical side of things. And, you know, that very much so the implementation aspect. Um, the Innovative Applications book focuses more on ways that people are using LibGuides that is outside of the box or not necessarily how SpringShare intended. Um, so we get into these areas where, you know, strictly out of the interest of what could or what could people do, uh, we took a look at all the different proposals and saw lots of things that people were doing that we never would have thought of and that we really didn't see people doing anywhere else. Um, so if, it, unfortunately, it's hard to talk about any one of these things in depth without sitting down and actually reading through the content because there's lots of steps involved in some cases. But if I could have somebody walk away with something from the conversation today or from the book if you chose to get it at some point, it would be, how could you be inspired to solve a problem that you didn't know that you had? Um, and that was really how I would sum up the Innovative LibGuides book, is there are things out there that the software can do which go beyond how it's being advertised. And we saw some really interesting examples of things. Um, so just to give you an idea, you can see how we broke things down in this book. There is a little bit of overlap on some things like integration, and part of that is just out of necessity. Um, some of these conversations do have to overlap a little bit. But we've got things ranging from people using LibGuides as a complete homepage, um, which is what we do at my institution, incidentally. The library got rid of our web page um, a couple of years back. And we replaced it entirely with LibGuides and have been highly successful with that. Um, from my perspective, uh, the transition was pretty easy. Um, it was harder to transition, and I did not write this chapter. This chapter was written by Jeremy Hall at University of North Florida. Um, but my personal experience was transitioning from LibGuides 1 to LibGuides 2 was more difficult than the initial transition just to using LibGuides as a website. Um, and we were one of the first to actually make that transition. And, and it was very successful for us. Um, it has been successful for Jeremy. It's been successful for a lot of libraries in other places. So if you're somebody that's thinking about replacing a hard-coded HTML library homepage with LibGuides, or it's something that maybe you hadn't considered, this is going to be a great place to look to kind of get some of the nuts and bolts ideas and also learn from mistakes that other people have made. Um, whole first section of the book addresses similar things. So we encountered people that didn't want to stick with maybe necessarily a standard um, library homepage, but instead wanted to look at alternate implementations. Some of them, in the case of that first chapter, were totally focused on, you know, SpringShare all the way. Other folks are using it as a supplemental product, either built in with WordPress or with Drupal. We even had one person, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, gentleman at Kansas State University, Jason Bankston, uh, he found a way to integrate with Easy Proxy, of all things. Um, and it's really quite interesting. That's probably the most technical one out of the first four, um, to make alerts for patrons. And again, it's not something that I expect everybody would use, but it's another one of those out-of-the-box approaches that we've seen come up. In a similar vein, we had some people taking a look at how it could be used with a learning management system. Now, some people just decided to see how it would integrate with Moodle or other technologies like that. That's great. Probably one of the most interesting things that we've gotten here is uh, Sharon Whitfield, Susan Cavanaugh, and Catherine Marchetta out of Rowan University decided to do an exploratory study where they actually made LibGuides their entire, uh, what's this question? Oh, okay, somebody asked where our library was at. Um, 
looking to see. I'm just looking through the chat real quick. Um, okay, sorry. I'm just reading through the chat trying to catch up. So the folks at Ruin did something interesting. They decided to take a look at LibGuides and just try making it their LMS. Um, I've heard of nobody else trying this. And I can tell you from my perspective, and I know Aaron agreed, when we think about LibGuides, we think of it as a content management system, and not so much necessarily a learning management system. Um, I'm, I hate making assumptions. So for anybody that's unclear on what I mean, I assume probably everybody know, already knows the answer. But if not, when we – okay, Aaron, thank you. Um, you know, when we're talking about content management systems, we're really looking at – you know, just storing and managing the content. And they wanted to look and see, you know, could it be used in a more advanced function to replace something like Moodle, D2L, Blackboard, um, Canvas, any one of those products. And they came up with a very clear answer. Um, <laughs> and I guess I'll leave that as a teaser. No, I'll, I'll tell you. It was, it did not successfully replace the LMS. However, the things they tried, the things that they successfully implemented, the things that failed, it's a very, very interesting story. Um, and I think for those of you that are doing a lot of work with instruction or being embedded in LMSs in different ways, it could be very beneficial for you to take a look and see what came out of their study. For those folks that are more interested in outreach, um, the digital collection section may be of a lot of interest to you. Um, Folks here looked at ways to use LibGuides as an outreach tool, either for, let me see some examples of sites that libraries have integrated LibGuides. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, give me just one second. Let me grab you a link. Folks, I have no problem adjusting the presentation. You know, you're giving us your time, so we want to make sure that we can give you something that will have some use. Um, let me pull up a link. Because I know just the thing to show you, which I think will be interesting. So addressing what's in the chat, so is this the case that people can only see what Aaron and I post? It does seem to be that way, yes. Yep. And I believe if folks choose to send something to all participants, they should be able to send to more than just uh, than just to the host. All right, it looks like that's not an option. I will look into that and see if I can give you that option. I can see it appears to be working for some people. Um, how Kirkwood, it went out to everybody. Hmm. Oh boy. All right. Well, well. Instead of worrying about how the chat's going, I'll try to respond into the chat. And Ryan, you just keep going. Um, give me a specific thing if you want something called out. I'll find it and post it into the chat. Sound good? Okay. Sounds good. Well, what I'm actually looking for right now is I just wanted to find the Wexler collection at Furman University um, digital collection because I think that would be useful for people to see. But if you want to go looking for it, that would be great. There we go. Aaron got it. So folks at Furman um, got a very large collection 
a very large art collection done by a gentleman named Wexler. I, the, the, the people that are expressing their condolences and their commiserations, I appreciate it. Um, this was not something we were able to test for in the run through. Um, so that would be an example of some place that really turned LibGuides into a beautiful, um, uh, a beautiful way to access digital collections. Um, compare that with, say, the folks we saw at University of Memphis and Ohio State University who have been using LibGuides as a way to provide content that can be immediately used by faculty at their institutions for instruction, uh, for a way to directly connect their physical collections to their digital collections by either using RSS, um, coming up with RSS feeds that work with it, um, QR codes, other ways of directly connecting those kinds of things. Um, and we've had some luck with that sort of thing at my institution as well. Um, we do, uh, huh, fine, okay, some people are seeing it. In hindsight, it's so obvious that we should have included these links. And I'm so apologetic that we didn't. Um, and it looks like it's fixed now that you should be able to communicate with everybody when you post to the chat. So, so okay, we're getting there. <laughs> for, for the people that have stuck around, I, I appreciate it. Um, so at any rate, we have had this luck at our institution. It is very iterative. Yes, Michael, I agree. Um, but we have made a lot of uh, – outreach has really captured my imagination in the past couple of years. And at Cal U, where I work, we have made a lot of inroads with connecting um, displays, digital collections, with things that are physically in the building. Sometimes as simple as just having people take pictures of things and post them to our Facebook pages or our Instagram, um, these folks have kicked it up a level. Um, so worth taking a look at. We have a section that deals all with data-driven decision-making, um, and that's really ways you can use the data that's generated within LibGuides, within LibAnswers, to make decisions about staffing and training, among all kinds of other things. Uh, we have done this at Cal. We, for one thing, modified our reference model based on the data that we were able to get from LibAnswers. Um, we have been able to determine, and for those of you that haven't used it, oh, there's the firm and Lincoln good. What are your LibGuide websites so we can look at some of the exhibition of the other LibGuide examples? Aaron, do you want to go grab um, something from University of Memphis um, to share right. with the Did people, we just please? Detect. Yep. Yep, thank you. Um, this is working much better now. So I can tell you we totally changed our reference model personally based on data that we were able to draw from what LibAnswers gave us. Uh, we changed our hours around. We changed our staffing around. Our implementation was different from what the folks who wrote these chapters did. Um, and this is folks at Louisiana State University, um, Andrew Herbert, Alice Daughtery, David Dunaway, and also people in St. Louis University, Jamie Emery and Sarah Fancher. Um, they've changed the way they've done things based on data. We've changed the way we've done things based on data. Quite frankly, I think what they've done was exceptional. Um, and it's a great overview for people that are looking at ways to kind of dig into that data and see how you can potentially change the services you're offering. Yes, the Furman site is just reskinned. It's customized. You're correct, Carl. Um, Okay, so moving on. Uh, connected to that's information literacy. Um, and again, this was an example. Uh, we have Amanda Peach at Berea College. She looked at ways to use LibCalendar to redo how they do reference and instruction. And that ties in very much so, I think, with the data-driven decision-making. Um, Certainly nothing to say of the modular research lessons for distance learners. It's another implementation. 
but they found, or I should say Amanda found a way to grab some of that data and use LibCal and change the things that they were offering. Um, can I slide in here for just a sec since we're talking about do. guides and LibCal? Mm -hmm. um, we, here at SHIP, we also took Lib, the LibAnswers module and we decided that we were going to expand across campus, so we took all campus offices and asked them, what are your most common and most annoying questions? And tell us what the answers are, and we'll make it so people can find that when they search the university website. Um, and we now have a process where we update it every semester. Uh, that's driven more more traffic to the library site, which in turn has led to more library research questions, which have led to increased research consultations, which we manage through LibCal, and it sort of all integrates. If you look at uh, library.ship.edu, you'll see we have everything consolidated in the left bottom, left lower corner uh, to do something like that. But what these guys talk about in the book is even more in detail than that. So it was pretty cool. Just responding to somebody in the chat. Somebody's asking if we can have a list of these sites available. I, I think that's very doable. Um, that's no problem. Um, so next section of the book deals with library administration. Um, so we've got staff training using LibGuides and non-instructional uses for LibGuides. Speaking from my personal opinion, um, I have been using LibGuides for staff training for about three years now. Um, my implementation is different. Uh, what I actually do is I, I have 16 work-study students and one graduate assistant that work for me. Um, and I did not write this chapter either. This was um, Stephanie Wise and Laura Newton at University of North Florida. Uh, their implementation is different. And again, I said before I started this talk that I, it would really hope that people could look at the book or even the ideas being presented today and use it as a way to inspire things and solve problems that maybe you didn't know that you had. So in my case, I needed a way to train 17 students as quickly and efficiently as I possibly could um, using no money and, <laughs> and little time. LibGuides provided a great opportunity to do that. Um, now, when I started the training, we were still on LibGuides 1. So I actually would create um, my training tools in other things. Uh, Google Spreadsheets, Google Docs, or Google Sites, what have you, Google Forms, again, because I didn't have money to subscribe to anything. And then I would pull that into LibGuides dynamically, and I have a whole portal set up for my work, study, and graduate assistant students. So it's their one-stop shopping on the website. They log into that portal. It's all password protected. It has their schedules, all the important email addresses, phone numbers, job responsibilities, schedule, you name it, it's there, including the training modules. Um, now that we've moved on to version two, um, I'm in the process of rethinking how I'm going to implement this because LibGuides version two is better for this implementation, in my opinion. Um, the way I'm doing it is different than the way the folks at University of North Florida have done it. So they will offer you one perspective, but it's certainly not the only one. Um, and that also ties in with non-instructional applications for LibGuides. We use it for a lot of internal documents. Uh, what's the question here? So then you have a CMS to password protect everything. Um, in a matter of speaking, I mean, basically what I'm doing you know, for my work-study students, for my portal, it's it's just a section of LibGuides, and I just password protected it. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with that feature, um, you can password protect individual pages on LibGuides or individual guides if you want to. So my work-study graduate system guide is password protected. Um, my understanding is that you need LibGuides CMS to password protect things. I don't think that's any longer the case. Aaron, can you speak to that? Uh, am I muted, or do you guys hear me pounding away on the keyboard? Am I, am I muted? No, I can hear you. I can hear okay, you. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, last I knew, it was still CMS, uh, unless something changed in the last six months. So I think that comment is correct. Oh, that, that's, I didn't realize that. Um, especially because I... Ha, ha, ha. 
I didn't think we had CMS where I'm at, but interesting. Okay, fair enough. Um, well, there would be ways around that too. Um, and I see somebody said, one of my regular users said that yesterday. All right, so that's, we need to find the answer to that question, Aaron, if we can. I am um, totally happy to be wrong on that assertion. Oh, CSS. <laughs> uh, at any rate, I see somebody else commented that somebody's using LibGuides to create professional portfolio and retention promotion. Yes, I've heard of that too. Um, I've got one set up. I'll try to link that too. Oh, wonderful. So, yes, these are the kinds of out of the boxes things. Do you have any chapters and case studies on implementing HTTPS on public facing LibGuides? I know there isn't in my book, and I don't, I can't remember if anything in Aaron's addresses anything on that in particular. I'll let Aaron address that. Um, uh, nothing specifically calling out HTTPS, HTTPS on public facing libguides. I know that Springshare has this on their front burner They're to go with the, uh, there's a privacy initiative HTTPS everywhere, and uh, my understanding is that that's being worked on, but uh, it's, it's not quite ready to go yet. And the very last thing that came up in this book is the North Carolina Community College Library System. Um, we had Suvenita Duangam and uh, Melanie Now at Wake Technical Community College contacted us, and they actually decided to do a case study of all 58 schools in their community college system. Um, so when I said earlier that I apologize that community colleges were not mentioned in the poll, it was very serious because, again, we. Uh, Suvenita and Melanie contacted all 58 schools um, as a part of this, as a part of the North Carolina Community College System, and they looked at a variety of things, including those who had actually converted to version two. Um, they all have access. Not everybody necessarily had implemented it. Not everybody had gone to version two, and everybody was using it differently. Um, it's kind of an interesting look to see how so many different people, <laughs> nice Aaron. It's also an interesting look to see how different people can see different things in the technology. Um, so having said all those things, uh, I would like to cut the book promo type stuff there and lead this into more questions and discussions. So, uh, Aaron, unless you have something else that you'd like to add here, I would say people that have questions, comments, um, please uh, throw them at us, and we will address them as well as we possibly can. Um, Let's see how many times we agree or disagree with each other. Yes, because we don't always agree. Um, I can also <laughs> – what's that? I was going to say we also saw, you know, I guess hundreds of proposals between these two books. Um, and – Obviously, not everything could make it in for various reasons. Uh, there are things that are people, there, there's lots of different ways people are using loop guides, I guess is the point. And so even if we're not doing it, we may have seen it or be knowledgeable with it. So we'd be happy to address that. Yes, let's get a definitive answer on the password protection because I was certain that they got rid of that as a part of LibGuide CMS. Okay. All right, so we've got Angela Sample asking how we handle things like when Springshare goes down, like for example, earlier this week. Um, honestly, we don't have a good solution for that. Um, we don't have a backup system in place. So when LibGuides goes down, um, so just like in Angela's example here, their whole website is LibGuides. When it goes down, the library website is down. Same thing for us. Um, this would be an example as to why some people, and I see um, Jane just said the same thing, 
it has been suggested to me in various instances, this is why some people don't want to commit to using LibGuides as their home page. Now, my personal opinion, Aaron, you can agree or disagree. Um, if you've got limited funds and librarians with limited time and various skill sets, um, <laughs> you know, it's probably the same story everywhere. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of picking the best solution for your situation. It has been very good for us. Um, for us, it's, you know, we're willing to make that trade-off, but this is why some people are, are making it a supplemental product to either an HTML site or a university website or building it into as, you know, something that's a sub of like WordPress um, or Drupal. Um, I think Drupal's fantastic, personally. Um, I think LibGuides does most of what I would want to do with Drupal, um, but makes it a lot easier for the work to be spread out. Um, that's another thing I should say. At my institution, we do have some, um, like we do have an admin, his name is Loring Prest, and he has final control over everything, but the librarians all do have a lot of access to create their own content. And for us, that's invaluable. Um, now, I do understand some schools don't, or some institutions, I should say, don't operate that way. Some places, they still do have one person doing everything. Um, and that kind of decentralized approach um, has been helpful for us and hurtful in some instances, just because not necessarily everybody wants to do things the same way. And that has created some dissimilar functionality between different subguides. Um, but that's, you know, the, it also has allowed us to customize things to work better with our department. So it's pluses and minuses. Aaron, what do you think? Definitely plus and minuses. Uh, sorry that I missed the initial part of your answer and the question. I'm, I was just pulling some of the sample sites to dump into the, uh, to the comments. All right, let's see what other people are saying here. I'm just reading through the comments right now, folks. Hold on one second. Rich, that's really interesting. Um, and it did go out to all participants. Everybody should be able to see it. I'm paranoid now that people aren't seeing comments. Um, but Rich mentioned um, you know, having the opposite situation, that when their website goes down, um, the header and footer from the site appear on the libguide um, because it's trying to load unavailable content. But that's an interesting way that you got around that, too. The other fun thing for Rich's comment there, uh, at Shippensburg, uh, we're using a, a CMS called Ektron for the university site. and uh, so the header is actually dynamically generated off of JavaScript web server, uh, JavaScript-based web server, excuse me. And uh, I ended up just copying everything over into my shared folder that, that goes into my personal web space uh, at SHIP, and then I linked to everything out of there instead. So I look just like the university website, um, but I'm not pulling anything off the university web server anymore because they were just so unstable for a while. Um, something else I could probably add to that, uh, at our university, our university website runs off of something called Cascade Server. Um, I don't know if anybody else has used Cascade, and I don't know if it's like this everywhere, but I'm not a fan. Uh, it's not, it's not a great piece of technology in my opinion. Um, and I am chair of our UCC, and our entire UCC content is is inside of Cascade Server. And so these two things are going to come together in a second. So I found out, oh, yes, I see somebody else mentioning the Cascade issues. Um, that's so I was told, what's that, Aaron? That's just such a nice way to say it. Yes. So I was told a few weeks ago that I should prepare because Cascade Server is going away. Yes, I hate it too, Angela, I'll be quite honest. 
Um, Cascade's going away, and it's going to be gone by December 2017. And now my thousands of files that are in the UCC website um, need to find a new home. And everything has to be migrated out. And so that's its own issue. But I've never been so grateful for LibGuys <laughs> because we're not worried about at this point anyway, we're not worried about SpringShare coming to us and saying, okay, LibGuides is going away completely, so now you have to find a new home for all this content you've made. Um, uh, that is one advantage, I would say, um, over doing something homegrown. I'm trying to catch up again on some. Aaron, if you want to handle some of these questions, you're welcome to do so too. I'm just reading down through. Um, so I'm just going to plug in my topic guides for what I think you're saying topic guides are for. Here's the uh, here's the SHIP University one. But yeah, I like the Pokemon Go one down from FIU. That was cool. Um, and no, LibGuide CMS is not learning management system. Um, it integrates well. We are actually in the process of integrating the back of our D2L, which is a Blackboard knockoff um, that just changed names. I forget what it is. But uh, pretty soon what will happen is we'll have a dynamic connection between D2L and uh, sites that we have over here in uh, LibGuides. And anytime they click a link out from whatever course, it will automatically either bring them to the, the guide that has been created for that class. Uh, linking behind the scenes, I don't have the actual vocabulary, and it did come out too late for the book, which is another uh, thing that I'd, I'd love to see someone write an article about later so we can read it somewhere. But um, the, the really nice thing is not having to maintain the connections between the various classes in D2L and the library of LibGuides anymore. Um, as soon as the dynamic linking is turned on and goes live, um, it'll automatically either bring it to the course guide if it's available or to a subject guide if the subject guide's been assigned by the de department or it'll go to a generic LibGuides page saying, welcome to the library, you're here and we don't have specific resources for you, but here's a great place to start, and then listing all that. So that's that's a great piece that's coming forward. Aaron, your link is er erroring out for us um, to the ship topic guides. Let me let me get it again. Okay. Um, somebody asked the question, let me make sure I can get, I can figure out where it's at now. Yes, LTI great... is what I meant. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Um, let's see. Where was that question? So are there features other products have that LibGuides does not have or does not implement as effectively? So that question came from Christian Pham. Um, from my perspective, there's really nothing quite like LibGuides. Um, now, depends on what aspect of LibGuides you're talking about, too. Because at this point, we use it for so many things at my institution. We use LibCal. Um, I, I do not use the scheduler. Um, I trialed it and, and thought it was horrible. Um, I probably, as somebody that's a LibGuides uh, evangelist on some level, I shouldn't say that, but I was exceptionally unimpressed with that function. Um, expressed my concerns to SpringShare. Last I knew, my issues with it hadn't been corrected. Um, but I mean, they don't answer to me on any level. So, um, so, but LibGuides offers a whole lot of bang for your buck in one package. And for libraries specifically, I can't say that there's any one product that's really going to replace them or be a good alternative. The individual pieces, if you have the tech know-how, the time, and the money, certainly you can go out um, and you can get lots of stuff. Like, for example, I said I would love to use Drupal. Um, there's, there's all kinds of stuff I would love to use, but the bottom line is LibGuides 90% of the time, it just works and just does what I need it to do. Um, uh, Aaron, what do you, oh, Bob Constantine. Um, CMS, yes, Content Management System. Um, and I think I addressed this before, but just again, so I'm clear on it. You know, when we talk about Content Management System, it's really a place to store information of whatever type and, and arrange access to it. Um, that's, that's a pretty simple explanation, I guess. But, um, Aaron, back. what would... What would you oh. like to say? Oh, just going back up to Marion Peters' question there. Um, the way we get our LibGuides awareness 
built out as we have the professors put it in all our syllabi. Uh, the subjects are come, come right off the library homepage. If you search our library homepage in the top right corner, the common search box location for most websites, um, any search subject search will come up. We have the bento box display, so you get all the lib guides that, are, that apply, all our lib answers that apply, and then any databases that might show up as something that's interesting. That also works for our campus search, so if you're on the university site and do the same search, you'll end up in the university's display of the same information. Um, but uh, that's, that's how we got everything. And then our, we have an active liaison program where we just go out and make faces at everyone until they tell us to go away. But uh, so that's, that's how we get into with our campus designers. Uh, um, oh, you should be able to index your, your libguides to, uh, do you have EDS or summon out there, Carla? Uh, we have ours indexed into EDS and it is okay, but I blame EBSCO rather than libguides for the wonkiness of those displays. Um, we have EDS as well, um, and we have not done that simply because it just no good no good reason. It just hasn't been done at our institution. But, and um, it's hard to explain to the student why am I getting yes. a library website here instead of what I wanted. Well, <laughs> so it, it's a good a good observation. Yeah, and I mean, and it's a really good point. Um, I mean, everybody's making good points, but I mean that it is a weakness. And I have seen some confusion where people can't tell the difference between our discovery service and LibGuides or a database and all these different, you know, the easy borrow system that we have built in, all these different things kind of flooding together. Um, I have not worked with Primo. Um, Aaron, have you ever worked with Primo? Um, I have not, thankfully. But at the same time, um, I'm, it should be fine. I'm just finishing an answer here. Right. Uh, replying in chat there. I forgot to mute, sorry. There's a question there, hold on a sec. There is not, in fact, at Shippensburg a standard syllabus. However, with good personal relationships and, you know, we're lucky we only have about 350, 400 faculty. So that's only 70 per librarian. Um, I, I say that with a <laughs> smile in my voice. But, yeah, I know, but uh, it's reasonable now because we, we have one more person than we did last year, and last year we were each at 100 people. Now it's only 70, so it's kind of a celebration. Uh, but it's it's personal contact and invitations and, and a bulk email to everyone in each department. Hey, this is your subject page. Please put it in your syllabus for your students' uh, effects. And then most of the faculty will just do that so students have somewhere to start their research. Um, it's it's not like it's required or enforced. It's It's an option that we make available as a friendly suggestion. And it's so ridiculous to me that I never even occurred to do that, <laughs> ever. So now I've got something new to take back to my faculty next week. Ryan, when you go outside the big blue room with that yellow thing up there, that's outside. Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. David, thank you for sharing that, um, for the indexing working well with UT Libraries. That's great. All right, now we've got a question about Canvas. Oh, yeah. Uh, Brenda, Canvas when you're at, are you asking about Canvas indexing, or are you talking or uh, comparisons to Canvas? I'm sorry, I missed some of the earlier questions. Okay, so Canvas Commons, the learning management system, right? Yes. Uh, I have. Oh, go ahead. So I was just going to say that uh, that one's one that I would have to Google to answer. Um, any sort of realistic manner. Rich, thank, thank you for sharing a lib staff for I'm processing as I'm typing it, or as I'm reading it. Um, I can tell you this past year, um, the PASHI system, which is the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education that Aaron and I both work for, um, we had a task force that looked at, um, and, and a, and a a full evaluation committee that looked at whether or not we should continue our contract with D2L or if we should switch to Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, you know, all these different things. Uh, ultimately, we had a, a couple successful bidders. So, but it's up to each individual cam campus, pardon me, whether or not we wanted to switch. My campus so far has elected to stay with D2L. So, while I think Canvas is a great product, my experience with it is very limited. 
Um, so I, I am not personally familiar with that answer. And Aaron, I don't know if you have other experience with it either, but. Not with Canvas, mostly D2L and Blackboard. Yeah, same here. It's just a side effect of where we work. Yep. Um, Do we see. have other um, on LibGuides and, and extending and embracing or is it embracing and extending? What does Microsoft do? Anyway, if you have other questions, um, either feel free to contact us. Both of us are Googleable. We're both on Twitter, uh, Facebook, pretty much everywhere. Um, any other any other comments from you? From well, we got Carl saying he's embedded in, in Blackboard for most courses. Um, same with me. Um, so with you so far. Build a module in Blackboard, but also a LibGuide and experience it integrating more directly. Um, people are asking if this is being recorded. Um, uh, as far as I know, the answer is yes, but our host could answer that better than I could. Just yes, this is, this is Mark <laughs> from HRL in Choice, and yes, we have been recording this, and we have been uh, uh, monitoring the chat. And as we go through um, in our follow-up communication to each of you, we will send out um, a list of links in that as well so that they are available um, to, to all of you um, because I think that that has been very widely expressed as, as something that folks would like and I think that would be a great thing to do. Um, right now we're about at the end of our time so I would like to take a, a second to thank you Aaron um, and you Ryan for for taking time out of your day to talk with us and for pivoting so so adroitly um, as uh, folks re made requests and asked questions. That was great. Um, and thank you to everybody who's here today to, to listen in and to ask questions. It's been an interesting and uh, enlightening conversation, so thank you all for, for participating. Um, we have been recording this, and everybody should receive a follow-up communication from ACRL and Choice with a link to the recorded version of that that should come out probably sometime tomorrow. Um, I'd like to give uh, both of our presenters today a virtual round of applause. Um, so thanks again for, for joining us and we will sign off now. Yeah, and I just want to say, you know, thanks to the folks that stuck with us. Um, you know, I apologize. If, if people felt as though it started off on the wrong foot. Um, but I'm, I'm happy that you stuck around, and I'm happy that we were able to get things, you know, more in the direction that you wanted to see. Um, certainly, you can get in touch with Aaron and I again. Like he said, we're on Twitter, Facebook. Um, my email is just my last name, at CalU. C-A-L, just type it in. You are more than welcome to email us. Um, we'd be certainly welcome, you know, give us a phone call, you know, whatever you want to do, we'll be happy to talk to you and share our experiences. Um, we're both LibGuides fans. Um, I've already expressed I'm not, I don't like everything about it, but I like, you know, I do think it has done a lot of good for us personally at my institution. And that's why we, that's why we did the books. Um, we just think it's a good piece of software. Um, and, and it's great support, and they've been very responsive to our requests and or demands to change things. So it's been pretty awesome mm -hmm. dealing with it. Yeah, so so I'm glad we can get things switched around for you folks, and we'll be happy to address anything again for you. All right. Thank you very much, and I hope everybody has a, a great afternoon. Thanks, all. All right. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it.